Please take your seat if you can for our next panel on illicit finance. We have a very distinguished panel and be extremely informative. These are, uh, frankly, two of the most thoughtful, respected individuals who understand this region and illicit finance transactions in this region uh, better than anyone I know. Uh, I would like to recognize Sarah Paquette, who will join us virtually. She's chairman of the Egmont Group and the director and CEO of Fintrack, which is the uh, Canadian FIU. So we thank you, Ms. Sarah Paquette. Also, Mr. Joseph Humeyer, executive director for the Center for the Secure Free Society. And Ms. Selena Real Uyo, president, pre professor of practice for the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies at the National Defense University. We will begin with Ms. Sarah Paquette, uh, who will join us virtually. Ms. Paquette, we thank you for being with us. Thank you, uh, and the organizer of the Parliament of and Security Forum for the opportunity to speak at this event today and accommodate me. We don't have a good connection, Ms. Paquette. Uh, the connection is not good. Um, do you want to reconnect? And maybe it'll be better, and we'll start the program. Um, I'm going to start with Mr. Humeyer, and then... Do you hear hmm? Do you hear him? Okay. Uh, you can please go again if you want. Do you hear me well now? It's, be it's much better. Okay. So do you want me to start? Th that, that sounds very good. Okay, so sorry about that. And uh, a big, big thank you for having me today. Uh, and a uh, big thank you for accommodating the fact that I'm here with you virtually. Uh, those events are very important. They bring together parliamentarians, government official experts. And it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity for us to bring together the best practices for combating the shared threats that we all face. At FinTrack, our vision is safe Canadian, safe economy. And we realize in an interconnected world where illicit finance can easily move from country to country, the best way to achieve this vision is through strong international collaboration. I have with me today, Caleb Galligan, who's helping me with the presentation and Deputy Director of Intelligence for FinTrack, Barry Mikalov. Next page. So I will give you an overview of FinTrack mandates and activities. I will describe some of the key illicit finance methods and techniques we have identified in the Canadian context. And then I will provide some real life example of those techniques. FinTrack is Canada Financial Intelligence Unit. Next slide, please. Uh, our mandate is to facilitate the detection, prevention, and deterrence of money laundering and terrorist activity financing while ensuring the protection of personal information. FinTrack was designed to safeguard the integrity of Canada's financial system and global financial framework while respecting uh, the privacy of individual and companies. So FinTrack is like all the other FIUs that are also member of the Engman Group. So next slide. At FinTrack, we have two key functions. It's compliance and intelligence. So on the compliance sector is responsible for conducting compliant activities such as receiving financial uh, reports, providing guiding uh, guidance to reporting identity, but also ensuring through examination that they meet their obligation. On the strategic side, we have the tactical side, which produce and disseminate tactical financial intelligence to our law enforcement. But we also have the strategic side, which use quantitative and qualitative research methods and advanced analytic techniques to identify in report on trend and patterns. On my next topic is the public-private partnership. That's one of the methods we use that has proven to be extremely efficient. 
Those PPPs are initiated by financial institutions who serve as project leads for the project. They work with FIUs, but they also work with law enforcement. Since 2016, we uh, launched five projects. The first one was uh, Project Protect, which was led by BMO. And uh, the initiative was to combat the laundering of proceeds they derived from domestic human sex trafficking. The second one was Chameleon, led by HSBC, and it was to combat romance scam. The third one was Project Guardian, led by CIBC, which was to combat the drug trafficking, trafficking of fentanyl. The last, fourth one was Project Athena, which was led by RBC and was to combat money laundering activities, in particular underground banking and professional money laundering that we are going to talk a little bit more today. And our last one, Project Shadow, was to combat child sexual exploitation and is led by Scotiabank. So moving to the specific issue of illicit finance, the next portion of my presentation will describe illicit finance mechanism. Financial intelligence units around the world, in light of the transaction report they receive and their specialized expertise in the analysis of financial flows, are well positioned to detect and deter little financing method and techniques through collaboration with law enforcement and the private sector. Through our analysis, our database of financial transactions enforcement information and open source report, FinTrack, as other FIUs in the world, is able to make several high-level observations regarding illicit financial flows. The illicit financial flows are defined by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime as financial flows that are illicit in origin, transfer or use, that reflect a transfer of value, and that cross-country orders. On the next slide, uh, you have a screenshot of FinTrack on professional money laundering through trade-based uh, money laundering and money services business. So this is publicly available on our website. But what you will find in this uh, ups alert is professional money laundering are critical to facilitating this illicit financial flows. PMLs are third party. They are not involved in the commission of the predicate offense itself, but they receive profit and benefit from facilitating the money laundering for others. They may operate with a, a network that includes money collectors and coordinators. They are correct in, co coordinating the cash pickups and the money mules. They also use international money controllers who broker money laundering deals on behalf of um, transnational organized crime. So the FIUs are playing a key role in facilitating this collaboration and giving the insight needed from the financial activity ongoing in all the jurisdictions. Next slide. The uh, FADAF, the Financial Action Task Force, defines three broad categories of methods used to hide illicit funds. And then economy. you have the movement of value through the formal financial system. You also have the physical movement of banknotes using methods such as cash courier or bulk cash uh, smuggling. And you also have the movement of value through international trade, which is what we refer as trade-based money laundering or TBML. Trading companies and trade-based money laundering techniques are used to launder critical proceeds on behalf of transnational organized crime groups through legitimate trade and or by commingling com illicit proceeds with legitimate uh, trade payment. So you can have uh, proceed of crime money going to another country to buy perfumes. And then the perfume are shipped back into the, the origin country of origin, which are the perfumes are sold and then the, um, the criminals have the money of the drugs back into their pocket. So next slide. Counter illicit finance through finance intelligence. What I want to do now is really draw your attention to three case studies that we have seen are happening right now. 
in Canada. So the first one is about trade-based money laundering. So in this case, we had a textile wholesaler located in Canada that was receiving a lot of money from different Latin American companies. The same individual was also uh, traveling to those Latin American countries, but as well as China and Hong Kong, and was coming back with um, luggage full of cash, different uh, currencies, US dollars, euros, Colombians, pesos, and they were um, disclosed at the borders, but uh, still uh, an interesting behavior. And we also saw that uh, that this textile wholesaler was immediately sending money uh, to shell company in uh, China and Hong Kong. And after that, we uh, following the money, we realized that those companies in China and Hong Kong were sending the money directly back to Latin America. So uh, looking at the intelligence, we realized that one of the correspondent bank was in Canada. So we uh, use our Clumpy and sector who will talk to the bank, do an exam, uh, evaluate the risk variance, and after that, more information was requested from those companies. The bank sees uh, their activities with those uh, companies. My next um, case study is about professional money launderer. If you look at, at the middle of the slide, you will really see how the organized crime group is structured. So you have the gambling well, and who recruits the casino gamblers, you have the real estate developers, and you have two uh, professional money launderers. So top left is uh, the uh, TBML, where China and Hong Kong shell companies are worrying millions of dollars to Canada. Top right, you have the money launderers nominee. Uh, bottom right, you have the money services businesses, may, which may be owned or used by the PML, you have the legal profession, which is retained to facilitate real estate transaction or the establishment of shell companies. You have real estate developer that are ties and, and are involved in loan fraud, a casino gambling and illegal enterprise. And at the bottom left, you have the gamblers who are repaying the Canadian uh, well uh, with wiring funds from their account to China and Hong Kong. So that's a very good example of how they are organized. The next case study is a, a money mule profile involving casino. So the step-by-step -step, uh, summary is uh, the mule is first receiving money from the professional money launderer, which deposit in, uh, in an account that has been just created or had very little uh, activities before. When the funds are, are deposit, um, they are layered via a casino transaction. So in this example, purchase of bank drafts um, or uh, you know, to itself or to, to other third party. And then they are those bank drafts are negotiated in casinos where they engage in a no or limited uh, gambling activities. There are also uh, cash withdrawal and credit cash uh, card advance uh, that are used at uh, casino ATMs. And you can see how that all goes. So a little bit of gambling, then uh, the mule will take the money back and deposit the money back into his own counter bank, uh, bank account. And uh, through our indicators, we have a note when those suspicious transactions are happening that the money was returned as funds and they were not for casino winnings. So when those indicators are appearing in our system, we have suspicion that money laundering is happening. And in that case in particular, the suspicious transaction report indicated that 3 million Canadian dollars was deposited in that new account during a period of nine months. And then when asked about the money, uh, the person was always answering that the source was uh, casino music, uh, casino winning. So in this example and the others, uh, the, the goal is always the same for uh, professional money laundering, is to utilize those methodology to bring cash, illicit cash into our regular financial system. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Paquette. And now we'll have Mr. Joseph Humeyer, the Executive Director of the Center for Secure Free Society.
Buenos días. Uh, de nuevo. Good morning, once again. It's always a pleasure to be here with you, sharing once again with uh, my colleagues here, Ms. Selena Reula, and hearing once again from the director of the financial unit in FinTrack and also from the leader of the group Egmont, Sarah Paquette. What Sarah said and what Selena is going to say, I believe, really is very conceptual about what illicit finance is. What I hope to share in the next few minutes is to give you a very key uh, case study related to Hezbollah in Latin America and how illicit finance happened. I'm going to switch to English as the panel is speaking in English. Uh, regardless, I still wanted to do my introduction in Spanish. And, uh what I'm going to do is give a case study and uh, two phenomenons that were uh, essentially thought of probably a little more than a decade ago as very separate phenomenons have been converging over time. I'm, sp I'm, spe I'm talking specifically about the phenomenon of international terrorism and the phenomenon of transnational organized crime. Uh, over the years, uh, the, many analysts suggested that these were uh, very different activities in their essence uh, that as uh, famously one writer said, uh, they had different motivations. Uh, criminals obviously are motivated uh, by profits and, and terrorists are motivated by political causes. Now that is true for the most part. However, there are connections and an increasingly a convergence of the two phenomenons, particularly within the illicit finance domain. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about a case study, both historic and actual, in terms of Hezbollah's presence in the region. So Latin America is no stranger to the presence and activities of Hezbollah in Latin America. In fact, in the early 1990s, it was a victim to the largest Islamist terrorist attack in the Western Hemisphere prior to September 11th in the United States. I'm referring to the two bombings, uh, first in Buenos Aires, uh, both in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The first uh, happening uh, against the Israeli embassy in 1992 and the second happening, uh, uh, an attack on the Jewish cultural center called the AMIA in the same city in July of 1994. Together, there are more than 114 casualties and uh, uh, many more injured. Uh, the important thing to recognize here is there were Latin Americans that died. Uh, there were Argentinians that died in these attacks. These attacks weren't necessarily just against uh, what other nations outside of the region, but specifically on Latin Americans. Uh, in these attacks, there's an interesting uh, aspect of it when it comes to the financing of the attack. One of the individuals, these are the individuals that are being uh, accused by the Argentine government for being involved in the attack, uh, former and some current uh, active uh, government officials of Iran and in one now deceased uh, high-ranking member of Hezbollah. But this individual right here, Moshe Rabani, was interesting in the sense that he was the mastermind, or according to the Argentine prosecutors, the mastermind of the attack because he prepared the logistics uh, for that attack. There was also a bombing the day after the AMI attack. Uh, so the AMI attack happened on July 18th, 1994. On July 19th, the day after, uh, there was a, a, an attack on uh, Alas Chiricana's flight 0091 that was a flight flying from Cologne, Panama to Panama City uh, that crashed, killing all 25 passengers on board. And, and, and in, in that attack, much like the Ami attack, there has not been yet perpetrators that have been uh, indicted and convicted of those attacks, uh, but it was also suspected to be at the hands of Hezbollah. More recently, there has been uh, information that led to some of the financiers of that attack uh, reside in Venezuela. So give me a quick anecdote of the financing aspect of the AMI attack because this has been very uh, not well known. So uh, the, the attack essentially took about 10 years to create the cap capabilities for Hezbollah to carry out such a high level terrorist attack. We have to remember that uh, more than 25 years ago, it was very uh, uh, poorly understood that Hezbollah could actually have a capability to carry out an attack f 
far away from its home base in Lebanon. It was actually probably considered impossible that they would be able to do uh, such a feat. But nonetheless, uh, the preparations for this attack took about 10 years in the making. When the first Iranian uh, operatives uh, arrived at their embassy in Buenos Aires. So from the period of 1983 to 1993, the embassy uh, of Iran in Buenos Aires uh, grew exponentially from approximately 13 uh, diplomatic representation inside the country to more than 63 officials by 1983, the year before the bombing. The majority of those officials were cultural attaches. And what those cultural attaches represented was the only legitimate commercial link that Iran and Argentina had was in the business of the beef trade. Uh, at the time, Iran, Iran uh, Argentina was one of the top five exporters of beef to Iran, which was very normal because uh, Argentina was one of the top exporters of beef around the world. The Argentine beef is, is very high quality. But instead of enjoying that commercial relationship as most countries would do with bilateral trade, uh, Iran uh, took advantage of that relationship and used it as a cover platform to insert its intelligence operatives in others. So many people arrived from Iran with the, with the title of cultural attaché and were accepted and accredited by the Argentine Foreign Ministry to grow their embassy to the size of having 63 diplomats in the country in 1983 because they were using the pretext of the halal certification process. Because Iran is an Islamic country, any import of beef into the country has to be certified by the religious and cultural standards. Argentina did not understand any of that. It's very foreign to their cultural and religious practice, but they also didn't want to interfere, meaning that it's a religious cultural issue. Well, that gave the pretext for Iran to abuse that re trade relationship and to grow uh, an intelligence presence that essentially helped finance the terrorist attack under the guise of cultural exchange. There are elements of this case that are still to this day not known, but are, are, are well documented by the prosecutors of the AMIA case, including its connections in Peru. Uh, the day, two weeks before the bombing, an Iranian businessman arrived in Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, and expedited a business visa from Argentina to Peru, uh, and traveled uh, to uh, Puno, I'm sorry, traveled to Pura, Peru, along the northern border with Ecuador, and returned to Buenos Aires on July 17th, 1994. If you look at the, remember the dates that we showed on the previous slide, that's the day before the bombing. Because the connections that come through specific zones that are mostly free trade zones in Latin America has become to connect a network that it, it was used to initiate the attack in Buenos Aires, but used to grow a network that's now a, a, a present in just about every country in Latin America. So this is a quick case study of what is a, a concept that Selena knows very well because at her institution, the National Defense University, and specifically at the William J. Perry Center, has done a lot of academic work on, which is the concept of convergence. So what is convergence? So as I was mentioning in my opening, that you know, for a long time this idea that criminals and terrorists will work together was considered a transactional relationship, meaning that they may be cooperating on small operations from time to time because of necessity, but there isn't a strategic link between the two. Well, that was mostly correct, except for the fact that there is a prominent connection among their logistics. That doesn't mean that terrorists are abandoning their political cause and just torn into drug profits or other criminal profits, or vice versa, the criminals are now taking up the cause of these terrorist organizations. But in the logistical domain, and I'm talking specifically within the illicit finance domain, there have been uh, multiple connections that drive this convergence to be able to occupy illicit economies throughout the world. This is a study by the Combating Terrorism Center of West Point from 2014. Uh, a report called Risky Business, where they did a empirical study of 2,700 known criminals and terrorists in a registered database. And when they did the network analysis of this study, they found that 97%, 97% of known criminals and terrorists that were indicted on one or the other charge had logistical connections, meaning they were either financiers, fixers, or facilitators of terrorist groups, as well as criminal organizations, mostly drug trafficking. 
If you look at the, the, the purple dots, those purple dots are mostly drug individuals or entities in this uh, study. Uh, the red dots are the terrorist entities or individuals. The green dots are what they, they call in the study suspected individuals. Those are the convergence points. Those are the logistical. To put it very simply, if you're an accountant for the Sinaloa cartel and Hezbollah then comes to Mexico, you're a good candidate to be an accountant for Hezbollah as well. And so these convergence points are what's essentially dominating and connecting what once was very separate phenomenons. And if you heard me yesterday, you know that a lot, there are certain spaces in certain countries where this convergence is now getting facilitated by state institutions. Uh, you heard the presentation from yesterday, for those that heard it, about how Venezuela has become essentially a global hub for the convergence of these two phenomenons. But if you look at its overlapping circles, you have the organized crime element, and you have the terrorist element, and you have the facilitators, fixers, and financiers being the glue between the two. But you add a third circle, which is the regime itself. And this is in select countries. It's not, thankfully, not too many countries around the world, but there are some that are providing state institutions to support these activities. In the case of Venezuela, the immigration services have documented thousands of known criminals and suspected terrorists to be able to provide them cover identities to be able to facilitate their movements all around the world. Last year, I wrote a report for the Atlantic Council that's available publicly on their website called the Maduro Hezbollah Nexus, where I document uh, the specific fixers, financiers, and facilitators that are the convergence points of Hezbollah with the Maduro regime. You might have heard in many uh, statements, uh, both political and press statements, about Hezbollah's presence in Venezuela, but there's very few documentation or reports that substantially argue or provide uh, more clarity on that point. So the, the, the purpose of this report was to do such that. And there's two takeaways, really, from the report. Uh, that's, these are two uh, diagrams from the report. The first takeaway is if you look at the presence, it's the little map on the right, on the left-hand side, I guess, for you guys. Uh, if you look at the presence, essentially, they are mostly located along the Caribbean coast of Venezuela because they're tied to import-export businesses. Uh, the, they're uh, uh, middlemen, essentially, for Hezbollah and the Maduro regime that use the import-export industry of Venezuela to be able to use it as a cover for action and money laundering, for drug trafficking, terror finance, and other activities. The second point is that most of these individuals ha are working to co-opt the Lebanese community. Now, let me be very specific on this point. The Lebanese community in Latin America is a very good community that's been very active in business, in community development, in uh, tourism, and has been a healthy aspect of the economies of many countries, not prominently Brazil, Paraguay, here in Panama, in Venezuela, in Colombia. But just like the Lebanese people in Lebanon, they are victims of terrorist organizations such as Hezbollah that look to co-opt those communities and steer them towards the illicit actors. In the case of Venezuela, being that Venezuela is a, 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 a country with a lot of illicit activity, that presence is more profound. So this report's available to the public where I go into a little more detail about who these individuals are and how it connects from, from high-ranking officials in the Maduro regime to uh, high-ranking officials from Hezbollah and to Iran. And I'll be very quick because I know I'm running out of time, but essentially you might have heard about uh, recently a potential of Iranian warships en route to Venezuela. It looks like, thankfully, they changed course and I think they're moving through the Mediterranean. But nonetheless, the logistical apparatus that was required to be able to potentially do that if it does ever happen in the future requires on uh, networks that are built in third-party countries. Uh, in the case of these, these are the oil tankers that were moving from Venezuela to Iran in 2020. Uh, where you would see uh, Algeria, Serbia, and Turkey used as third-party countries to facilitate that movement. You can add Mauritania to that list. You can add, um, um, I'm forgetting another country to that list, but they're building these third-party country networks to be able to facilitate movement that didn't exist uh, in the past. But this is the, the crux of the message I would like to leave with you with today, especially for the parliamentarians that are in attendance. Uh, one of the very practical results of this specific forum, the Parliamentary Intelligence Security Forum, which goes back to 2016, when I, at least for me, when I first participated with Congressman Pittenger, is that this has been the leading forum to advocate for the designation of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization in Latin America, to be able to empower 
the financial intelligence units to have the ability to, to, to prevent potential terrorist actions. We have to always keep in mind that the difference between anti-terrorism uh, and combating transnational organized crime is that in anti-terrorism, uh, you have to prevent the action. You cannot wait till the bomb goes off because then it's too late. And these three countries, beginning with Argentina in July of 2019, uh, became the first country in the history of Latin America to designate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization that's provided them with more capabilities to their financial intelligence units and provided uh, more connectivity to the international community that's growingly concerned on these. Paraguay followed, Colombia, Guatemala, and Honduras are the five countries. I highly uh, endorse and recommend that Panama joins this growing list of community countries throughout the world. We have now more than 63 countries worldwide that have recognized Hezbollah as a terrorist organization that provides more than just the same language, but also provides the ability to have practical cooperation at a level that becomes much more clear than to clear up any confusion as to the de definition of what Hezbollah could be. Hezbollah is a multi-dimensional organization. They have political party representation in Lebanon. They do social projects in the southern part of the country but they're also a major terrorist organization. They're also a transnational criminal organization. And so in that sense, we have to clear up that confusion by providing legal definitions that allow the international community to combat that convergence. And with that, I end and I'll pass uh, the podium to my colleague, Selena. Thank you once again. Thank you. Outstanding presentation, Joseph. Uh, Selena Raleu, uh, please uh, join us and with your remarks. Good morning, and thanks again to Congressman Pittenger and to Alejo Campos for the opportunity to uh, speak with you all. And it's a real privilege to be on the panel with Joseph Humeyer as well as Sarah Paquette. What I'm going to do um, in the next 15 minutes is really try to bring why we're all here to that strategic level. Why do illicit financial flows present a threat to our national security and prosperity around the world, not just here in Latin America? So let's begin taking a look at the globalization of illicit networks. So after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the world really became much more globalized. When we're thinking about free trade, commerce, the free flow of people, human capital, um, financial capital, um, and also the technology and communications that really revolutionized unprecedented growth, bringing billions of people out of poverty. Unfortunately, we've seen in the last year and a half how the pandemic shows the dark side of globalization. And even before the pandemic, we know that illicit networks that includes terrorist groups, criminal organizations and their facilitators took advantage of this more interconnected um, and more dependent um, actual economy to make their money. And this is what we're gonna be taking a look at is how big this economy is. So these crimes have existed since the age of the Romans and the Greeks. But if we take a look at why is it such a big problem now is that with globalization, the magnitude, the velocity, the wealth, and sadly in this region of the Americas, the violence that continues to plague many countries makes it more unique than other parts of the world that have um, illicit economies. And just you can see the trillions of dollars that are made from counterfeit goods, drug trafficking, um, migration, uh, as well as arms. It's all combined. And this is actually why in 2011, the US government changed the name from drug trafficking organizations to transnational criminal organizations in its national security strategy to combat transnational organized crime, recognizing the diversity of activities that these groups were engaged in. What we've also seen is that these groups are taking advantage of the same global supply chains that large commercial legitimate businesses, whether they be Apple, Coca-Cola, or Walmart take advantage. And we look at these global supply chains in four different perspectives, right? What is going through from point A to point B in terms of materiel? Who is actually um, controlling 
and safeguarding that supply chain. And unfortunately, because of the scourge of co corruption, this is one of the areas we find very vulnerable in terms of supply chain management. The money, who is actually investing, who owns the different stages of that supply chain, and what mechanisms are being used. We spent a lot of time the last two days taking a look at cybersecurity and the cyber realm as a new domain that groups are using for the good and the bad. When we think about different groups, and this is something that we've seen in the case of the United States, we learned a lot over the past 20 years with our um, engagements, long engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan. How these groups, whether they be terrorist or criminal in nature, organize themselves. So we've always traditionally looked at leadership, right? Command and control, uh, decapitating different groups. But we actually expanded our aperture to better understand what are the other critical factors these groups need. First, that environment of corruption, the illicit activities that they depend on. How are they using technology and how are they managing their logistics? How are they recruiting and retaining their personnel? And how are they arming themselves to use the threat of violence or actual violence to promote their nefarious agendas? What do they all have in common? It's all about the money. Without financing, these groups cannot survive. So we always look at the financing as the oxygen for these groups to maintain their control and expand their activities. So as Joseph mentioned, at the National Defense University, I had the privilege of writing a chapter um, of, on this book called Convergence, where it was the first time that we recognized that terrorist groups are getting engaged in criminal activities and criminal groups, such as the Mexican cartels, are borrowing terrorist tactics um, in order to promote their different agendas. And as Joseph mentioned, terrorist groups are motivated by political objectives, and criminals are just interested in maximizing their profits. But what do they have in common? Those facilitators. In terms of facilitators, we talk about people who offer safe passage, safe houses, but the financiers are the ones that we're interested in and we're focusing on uh, during this forum. So the convergence of terrorism and crime is manifested throughout the world. Perhaps in the news in the last five years, the most illustrative case is that of the Islamic State or ISIS in Iraq and Syria and beyond. Um, and we used financial intelligence and financial targets to really uh, dismantle the ISIS network, going after the chief financial officers on the Syrian side, as well as the Iraqi side, um, which really helped deal the final blow to the physical Islamic State and Caliphate. We still are dealing with almost 20 years in Afghanistan, where the Taliban, the Haqqani network, and the remnants of Al-Qaeda engage in corruption, um, graft in corruption, but also drug trafficking uh, to sustain themselves. And in Africa, we have the examples of piracy and al-Shabaab in East Africa, and Boko Haram and human trafficking in the case of Nigeria. And in this hemisphere, we still have the FARC dissidents and the ELN, very active in Colombia and Venezuela, living off of drug trafficking, but even more importantly now, illegal gold mining, as well as the Shining Path in Peru and Hezbollah in the Americas that Joseph just presented on. So the bigger question is, how are we perceiving the way these groups are evolving, especially in the context of the pandemic? We all agree that governments have four basic missions, right? To provide security, to promote prosperity, to ensure a sense of society or a rule of law, and then governance, that the government represents the political free will of the people through transparent elections. And all of these different activities, though they're not new, threaten those four basic missions, and they feed off of illicit financial flows. So we think about the convergence of illicit networks in the Americas. I hate to say it and admit that my country, the United States, continues to be the destination country for people and drugs, and we do pretty good exports of arms as well as dirty money. But what's happening now, we can't just talk about North and South especially with the advent of synthetic drugs. All of the countries in the region are involved in these different flows. And that's why we have to work together in order to overcome and address and detect how these groups are evolving. 
So as you all know, as Sarah's presentation um, indicated, we always take a look at how these groups manage their financial flows. How are they raising money? How are they moving their money? Where do they keep their money? And how do they spend their money? For those who don't follow it so closely, in terms of counterterrorism uh, financing operations, the spend area is very important to understand how groups are preparing and scouting out targets through their expenses in order for law enforcement and intelligence agencies to prevent another such 9-11. And as you can see, the difference between terrorist financing and money, and money launderers is in terms of terrorist financing, they can actually take clean money or money from donors in order to support their organizations, which creates that extra complexity when you're working on terrorist financing, although the methods are the same. And you can see here, you all know what methods they're using. But what's new is the use of the internet and digital currencies. And governments have been slow to build the capacity for us to be able to monitor, detect, and dismantle groups that are using um, that digital space. Because all the crimes that have been taking place in the physical world are now being copied and mimicked, even expanded in some cases, in cyberspace. So when we think about cyberspace, it helps us each every day, right? We can't actually live without our iPhones or our Androids. But we have to also understand how the evolution of technology, communications, and new applications in the digital space not only help us, but how is it helping what we call the dark side of globalization. So when we think of illicit financial flows, um, I've spent most of my time in the last 20 years looking at terrorist groups and criminal groups, but we also have to talk about corruption. And more importantly, when we define illicit financial flows, we look at tax evasion that deprives countries and capital flight of important funds that could be used for socioeconomic development. So in the past, you all remember that money laundering was considered a white collar crime or a victimless crime. It's not. We are all the victims because it really damages the legitimate economies that fuel economic growth um, in all of our countries. The other thing we take a look at are how the funds are actually the product of crimes. Then the third piece is how they use those funds. And there's more interest now in illicit financial flows, especially at the multilateral level, but we have to do something and be more proactive about it. And this is how we categorize the types of illicit financial flows. But unfortunately, many of our jurisdictions are still very slow to update the legal framework in terms of adapting and even anticipating the way illicit actors are using and then more importantly moving and hiding their money. So as you all know, perhaps the general public only knows about money laundering and terrorist financing through popular pop culture, through Netflix, and I picked a couple of interesting movies that I've seen. I am guilty of being a viewer of Netflix. The Accountant, which is really about money laundering. The Lord of War, which is about arms trafficking. Taken, which is sadly about human trafficking. And then Narcos. And they even have two episodes in Narcos Colombia about how Panama was used by the Cali and Medellin cartel. But what is this doing? This is actually glorifying these groups and giving an image to youth at risk who have a choice to join the dark side or to try to find jobs in the illicit economy. And this is where education plays a very important role as we develop our human capital to fight um, transnational organized crime um, and terrorism around the world. So when we think about how we need to better equip ourselves to combat transnational organized crime and illicit networks in the age of the pandemic, I mentioned this yesterday in my chat, thinking about how we expand the role of security forces in the pandemic, taking into consideration that we need to train and equip for the cyber age a lot of those who are our front line to protect the security of our countries. The other thing is we have to be better about understanding how these groups are evolving and adapting. They're very nimble and they're very motivated. And this is something that we are always trying to play catch up. And this has been historic in terms of government response. We also need to focus on those areas in terms of youth at risk and strengthen the presence of the legitimate state in all parts of the region 
And then more importantly, we have to follow the money. And that's why we're all here. Uh, this two-day forum has really covered many of the different aspects of uh, threat finance, but more importantly, how we can work better individually at the national and the international level. So how do we do that? It starts at that national level. So we've always put this framework together of having a legal framework together, this importance, as Sarah highlighted, of the collaboration between the private sector and the public sector in terms of financial regulations and the submission of suspicious transaction reports, and then that very important bridge that is represented by the Financial Intelligence Unit that puts together this intelligence and then creates and develops cases for law enforcement to investigate and then finally for the judiciary to prosecute. Where are we on this? Since all of our legislatures take a long time to debate and develop new laws, we have to become much more agile and, and as fast as the illicit networks that are threatening us. And that's what we've seen, these three interconnected ways that we could develop a comprehensive program to combat illicit financial flows. First, the idea of detecting, and this is where capacity building and training of your personnel is so important, whether you sit in the private or the public sector. Um, people dread training, but now more than ever, it's so important as the methodologies and typologies change on a day-to-day -day basis. And then more importantly, it's one thing to open a case, but it's so much more important to prosecute and bring these financial criminals to justice. And through lessons learned of the cases that we've seen, we need to invest in prevention. I know many of you actually represent the private sector, um, and we need to really kind of couch the concept of compliance and detection and training as an investment as opposed to a cost center. Then we take a look at how we can really focus on curbing financial flows. We need to fight crime and uh, corruption at every level. I still think of corruption as the critical ingredient that allows terrorist groups and criminal groups to thrive. Um, and sadly, it is a scourge in all of our countries at all levels. Then more importantly, we have to more deliberately use financial intelligence to identify, and then more importantly, use it as an instrument of national power to dismantle these illicit networks. And as I mentioned before, really trying to expand the way we use laws, updated laws, um, including more transparency. In the United States, we passed the historic law on beneficial ownership that really removes this issue of anonymity for shell companies, and we hope that other um, partner nations will do the same. And then lastly, which is actually quite important for Panama itself, is to implement all of the UN conventions and the FATF recommendations to combat money laundering and the financing of terrorism. This afternoon, I understand Minister Pino is going to speak about their initiative here in Panama to deal with um, uh, asset forfeiture. So that's my favorite instrument in terms of the toolkit in combating illicit financial flows. Since these criminal groups want to maximize their profits, the best way to hurt them, the best way to disable them, is to take their money away and then use that money for development and more important, to reinforce uh, the security apparatus that each country has. And this is something that we've seen throughout the Latin America, but around the world, how asset forfeiture, and then more importantly, the return of assets is very important. As you know, we're, uh, uh, both Joseph and I spend a lot of time looking at the case of uh, Venezuela and the stolen assets by the Maduro regime. That's one of the big objectives once democracy is restored to Venezuela is how to get those assets returned to Venezuela to uh, reconstruct that country. And just as I tried to point out, whether we're fighting terrorist groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, or criminal groups um, like the Mexican cartels and different mafias around the world, we have to do a better job using um, that financial trail and we can be complemented now by tremendous technology, such as Bitcoin, to identify who those facilitators are of these groups. Many of these facilitators don't share the ideology 
what they're doing is they're a service provider and they're also in it for the money. And just to kind of reinforce, at the national level, each of our countries needs to um, really dedicate ourselves to better interagency collaboration because no one agency has a monopoly on curbing financial flows. And then more importantly, since money has no flag, no nationality, and more importantly, is such an enabler of these transnational threats, we need to really reinforce um, international cooperation. And I applaud the efforts of Congressman Pittenger and Alejo Campos for putting together so many representatives from across the world to spend these two days to focus on how we can do a better job at curbing um, illicit financial flows, and more importantly, in order to promote prosperity and security in both of our country and all of our countries at the national level, and then more importantly, at the international level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Selena. That was absolutely excellent. You and Joseph gave a very succinct, clear understanding of the challenges that we face and the process of what needs to be addressed uh, to be able to get the attention of every country in this region uh, to go after our adversaries. Today, we have five countries who have designated Hezbollah a terrorist organization. We have Argentina, we have Paraguay, we have Honduras, we have Colombia, we have Guatemala. We need the rest of the region to designate Hezbollah a terrorist organization. And we need every country to be in compliance with FATF, including Panama. And we hope still that President Cortez will come to join us and make his case for what Panama is going to do to be in compliance with FATF. Now, we had the great honor to hear from His Excellency Saad Mubarak, Saad al-Lafal, uh, Naomi, the ambassador from Qatar in Panama. We're most pleased and honored to have you, sir. And let me say, Qatar has been a great asset to us, an advocate. Uh, ambassador Mashal Althani, the ambassador from Qatar to the United States, has been very supportive and wants this mission to continue. So I appreciate the interest that you have to address the illicit finance issues in this region and the tie that they have back to the Middle East. Mr. Ambassador, please join us. Thank you, our friend, uh, Congressman Bettinger, regarding the small uh, uh, words about uh, Qatar. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, and I'm honored here to be today to Berlatimene uh, Intelligence Security Forum to speak before. Oh, okay. Gracias. To speak before such visual audience international security regarding from cyber security, committing terrorism financing or for which under the terminal refuse of the form have become international security and the urgent subject to final solution and to defend and uh, protect it. I would like to take this opportunity to speak about our challenge, challenge of the international security in our uh, region and facing, um, facing in Qatar offered to the address them. In the Middle East, long, many, long been many things to many people, protection in the last several dictated and the seen a project of the internationality in invasions and the civil war, but in this also seen uh, dramatic organizations, affiliations, and the development as well, admissions, ambitions, a program to the economic of the civil, uh, the social reform. All of you, maybe you have a 
familiar with Qatar as a small peninsula country in the Arabian Gulf. Qatar has the third largest uh, national gas surface in the world, and Qatar Petroleum is the world's top liquid national gas producer, which expanded the hyper hypercarbon international uh, hypercarbon industrial. However, we have also been building a diversified knowledge-based economic as bear as in our nationals vision 2013. Qatar's location in the Middle East has made uh, border security and a special priorities. The adoption of a new technology and the novel vision of the electric financing have made our collective national securities more favorable to the uh, to the uh, dispersion and the military fair, uh, forces. The actual between the drug traf uh, traffic, uh, tra uh, trafficking, trafficking international organization crime and the tourism group have extended the to reach the new source of the tourism financing. Since 2014, Qatar has passed a law increasing the government overseeing of the charities regulations around uh, regulations around fundraising including through the social media in 2018 expanded Qatari's anti-money landries and the tourism funding regulation framework regulations and investigations who the commit act the tourism as the joint tourism groups as a part of the non-going communities committed tourism and the tourism finalization our nationality counter tourism communicated blessed 28 individual on the tourism list including several Qatari individual those are our actions but it must straight for the anti and the international cooperations are credible that uh, combating terrorism towards an achievement stability and the place of the region i want to take i want to emphasize the importance of the religions the multinationals alliance like uh, gcc countries and the arab league as well as united nation Interpol and Interpol for the safe ground our people and our economy. Only by the executive and more the comprehensive information sharing and the exchange of the best will be able to, the, to ensure that our effort to combat the tourism to a violation, uh, violent extremists are active. We have worked and uh, continue to work with the international coalition and organization toward the goal. Qatar is active by uh, partnership and with USA lead global coalition against ISIS and the host of most important military facilities of the Middle East, Al Udaid Air Base, from the which strict against tourism. Uh, tragedies are the land share. As the Highness of Emir of State of Qatar in 2015, with interview with the Washington Post, he said, bullets and the bombs alone will not win the war on terror. Ad addressing the road causes and the tourism will be required a deeper, long term, and more strategic approach the problem. Therefore, Qatar has a focused additions efforts, established a program and individual that support youth, employment, the sport, health, great grant equality, education with the globe, the creative, a better future for the, our generations to become. And intending this program to create conditions organization will no longer be able to separate populations. 
Lastly, the United States, as the leader of the free world, and Qatar, value of the good relationship with the, uh, uh, the close partnership and the collaborations uh, of the USA and the others, global islands, we stand ready to cooperate more uh, extensively on this global of the important mission of the host form. Thank you so much. Wonderful remarks. Thank you, sir.